get going. So let's see, it looks like we're just missing two people. Matthew and Nathan, are you on with anyone? Are any of you all on with anyone? Uh, I don't see you in the queue. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started. It's, it's 8.30 and we've got a fair amount of material to cover today. Uh, so we've actually found ourselves a little behind, a little behind in lecture. Uh, so there'll be a little catch up I need to do. Uh, that's okay because we will not have a lab today. That's a big uh, housekeeping. There will be no lab this afternoon. Uh, however, we will have a full lab uh, tomorrow uh, like we did yesterday. And it seems like the lab yesterday really helped a lot of people out. It looked like there were some breakthroughs that were going on as far as uh, giving uh, medicated infusions and mixing and calculating drip rates and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it seemed like the lab really helped a lot of people out yesterday, and we will continue doing that on Thursday. And then, of course, next week will be spring break. There will be a series of quizzes that will open. I think there'll be three quizzes that will open up through through next week. So please check uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday morning. Um, there'll be uh, review quizzes that will open up. They will have some additional dosage calculations questions in them, as well as some uh, as well as some other uh, review content, uh, just to keep everyone thinking about pharmacology. And then when we resume regular classes the week after spring break, uh, we will pick back up uh, talking about the uh, topics that we need to finish up, as well as uh, labs that will focus primarily on vascular access, obtaining uh, vascular access through peripheral uh, peripheral venipuncture, interosseous axis, and uh, then that will take us to the final week of pharmacology, uh, where we will uh, conclude and then pivot right into ECG interpretation from there. So are there any questions before we go into, go into lecture proper today? Anybody have any questions? I think I've got almost all of the assignments, the uh, dosage calculations homework graded. Please check the comments. Um, some of you uh, did not just just didn't do the questions or didn't write the answers down. Um, so there are a couple of people that didn't do that. I did uh, write the answers in uh, in my comments. And if you're having issues calculating, uh, particularly flow rates, I believe there was a um, a lidocaine infusion and a dopamine infusion question on the homework. A couple of people struggled with those. Uh, so if you're still having issues, uh, please get with us tomorrow and we can work with you and try to help you out there. Uh, but I think that hopefully the lab yesterday really helped a lot of people out. Um, in addition to that, uh, uh, I was not very harsh, but you did lose partial points if you did not um, put uh, leading zeros. So uh, there were a couple of answers. There was one that was 0 0.5 kilograms, uh, 0 0.2 milliliters. And if you did not put a zero in front of the decimal point, um, you did lose. You got, um, you lost partial credit. Um, you didn't lose, you didn't get the entire question wrong, but you lost a little bit uh, just because um, we want to avoid those kinds of errors at all costs because they can enhance or increase the possibility of a, of a medication error occurring uh, when you are documenting or communicating uh, med orders to other people. So we just want to make sure that we develop those good habits early on. All right. Uh, so with all of that out of the way, let's just jump into where we left off yesterday. So we had just finished talking about the major classes of antidysrhythmics, at least using the Von Williams classification. And uh, I was just beginning to talk about some of the miscellaneous agents that are in use. And so I think that's where we will pick up lecture today. <laughs> 
All right, there we go. All right, so we just finished talking about magnesium and I was uh, going to talk about digoxin. So let me go ahead and just do that right now. So digoxin, also known as lunoxin, it belongs to a, a class of, of agents known as cardiac glycosides. And essentially what these do, their basic mechanism of action, of which digoxin is most commonly used therapeutically, is they essentially inhibit the sodium potassium pump, the sodium potassium ATPase pump. Uh, they interact with that and they inhibit it. And that leads to some interesting downstream effects that go on inside of the cell. So we'll talk about that. And these are specifically cardiac myocytes. And not to overly complicate it, but essentially what it does is it leads to an accumulation of calcium ions in the cardiac myocytes. And so essentially what this does is digoxin can decrease the heart rate, but is what we call a negative chronotrope. Chronotropy is rate, decreases the rate of depolarization, um, while at the same time can increase contractility. So that's what we call a positive inotrope. So Traditionally, digoxin has been used to treat people with heart failure, congestive heart failure. Although as of recent, um, it has kind of fallen out of favor for other kinds of patients, but occasionally you still see it used for congestive heart failure. And it is sometimes used to treat patients with chronic dysrhythmias. Often atrial fibrillation is the common dysrhythmia that we see um, because in AFib, you have uh, essentially the atria, the top part of the heart are fibrillating. And so you have very rapid disorganized electrical activity occurring. And if that electrical activity gets down into the ventricles, that can cause the ventricles to be de begin depolarizing rapidly. And that's something called AFib with RVR, or rapid ventricular response. You can see this as something else called a flutter. And so digoxin can slow that down and enhance contractility in patients, specific patients who are in chronic atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is actually a very common dysrhythmia. It's one of the most common uh, chronic dysrhythmias that we run into. And we know that AFib is associated with lots of issues such as uh, developing blood clots in the atria, specifically the left atrial appendage. And if those blood clots get dislodged, um, they can uh, go to the brain and other organs. And so the, the risk of stroke is elevated in people with atrial fibrillation. So oftentimes, if someone is in chronic atrial fibrillation, they'll be on something like digoxin to help, help control the rate. And they'll also be on uh, either an antiplatelet or an anticoagulant agent as well to prevent clots. And sometimes they'll even insert devices inside of the atria, uh, specifically a, a little flap, a little open flap of, of, of tissue called the left atrial appendage. And they'll in, and put a device, something like a, a watchman is a commonly used device. And it essentially fills the, the appendage. It opens up, fills the appendage and kind of blocks it off. So clots uh, don't form in that, le that left atrial appendage. So what do we need to know about digoxin? Well, digoxin has a very narrow therapeutic index. And so that is to say the concentration uh, between uh, the therapeutic concentration and toxic concentration is very narrow. And digoxin can interact with lots of different meds, can interact with lots of different meds and if your electrolytes are not normal, even if you are taking digoxin normally and you have a normal level of digoxin in your body, uh, that can become toxic, particularly if you have potassium imbalances. So lots of drug interactions. And if your potassium is imbalanced, 
um, that can lead to digoxin toxicity. Um, and lots of different things happen with ditch toxicity. It's very tough on the heart. Um, it can cause very slow rhythms, and sometimes it can even cause very fast rhythms. It can be rather unpredictable. Another common finding with digoxin toxicity is discoloration of your vision. And so people that have dis, uh, digoxin toxicity will have yellow, yellowish color in their vision and they may see yellow halos or a yellow halo like effect around bright lights. Not everybody who's ditch toxic will have these findings, but some people will. Um, so that's kind of digoxin in a nutshell. If somebody's on digoxin, you really want to investigate it because is because their problem could be related to uh, the digoxin itself. There is an antidote for ditch toxicity. It's, it is a, um, it's an antibody. It's a monoclonal antibody called Digibind. You can give it, it will bind to the digoxin uh, molecules in the body and uh, then uh, can treat some of the more toxic effects of digoxin and other cardiac glycosides. There are um, various plants that contain glycosides. And in fact, early on in the, um, in the, the COVID um, epidemic, as it was becoming pandemic, there were uh, some reports of people that were using a plant to treat or prevent COVID, and that plant contained large amounts of cardiac glycosides. And so, um, you know, you do occasionally run into that. Does anyone happen to know what plant, it's a fairly common plant that contains cardiac glycosides? No clue. No clue. Um, so there are several. Um, there's a plant called the um, the foxglove. Um, it's really common in the, like the Pacific Northwest. Really pretty flowers. Um, the oleander plant as well contains car uh, cardiac glycosides. Um, so those would be kind of the two common examples I could think of. Um, the uh, the uh, oleander, uh, various species of oleander and um, foxglove. And so occasionally people can consume those and will develop ditch toxicity or cardiac glycoside toxicity. All right, so that is essentially most of the important stuff that I wanna cover as far as anti-dysrhythmics. Uh, so just a review, Remember the class one agents and the class three agents primarily act upon ventricular tissues, whereas class two agents and class four agents primarily work on nodal tissues. So they are typically used for different things. And remember, uh, with your class two, your beta blockers, you have different categories of beta blockers, right? You have your non selective, your mixed alpha beta, and your cardio selective. With the class four agents, you have two major categories of calcium channel blockers. You have the dihydroiridins, which tend to block calcium channels in vascular smooth muscle. And so the dihydropyridines are uh, typically going to be used as blood pressure, as any hypertensive agents, things like nifedipine or procardia amlodipine or nicardipine, also known as cardine, whereas the non-dihydropyridines, um, such as verapamil and diltiazam, tend to have more impacts on the heart, on calcium channels in the heart, uh, specifically in nodal tissues. And so they are primarily what we use as antidysrhythmics to treat tachydysrhythmias. AFib, aflutter, SVT, PSVT, things of that nature. But they can also lower blood pressure because they decrease contractility of the heart. 
And so that in itself can lower uh, blood pressure. And that is one of the side effects you see with something like diltiazem, which of course um, is used um, here in the uh, crucis area, right? Um, so if somebody is hypotensive, you actually would not want to administer a calcium channel blocker. Um, you would want to look at using a different agent or you might consider electrical therapy if they're hypotensive and unstable. But we will talk about that when we actually learn about cardiology proper here in a few more weeks. Okay, so now what I wanna do is I wanna move on and I want to talk about the diuretics. These are uh, five major categories of agents that cause diuresis, essentially. They cause you to urinate more or to get rid of free water. So in general, why would we use diuretics? Well, diuretics can be useful as antihypertensive agents. So blood pressure control, they can be useful for certain types of heart failure. Um, they can also be useful in certain situations where you may have fluid in areas of the body where you don't want it, such as in the brain or cerebral edema. Um, occasionally, these agents may be used to help manage uh, pressure in area, very specialized areas of the body, such as the eyes, for example, right? Increased or elevated intraocular pressure, um, certain kinds of diuretics may be used to help pull fluid out of those areas. So those are some of the major indications. And so let's talk about some of the major examples. All right, so there are five major categories of diuretics. And the categories are based on where in the body the diuretic works, where is its major mechanism of action. And the major mechanism of action is gonna be related to the nephron. The nephron is a functional unit of the kidney. So the nephron consists of being very basic here, this part up here where the blood supply comes in, right? So the uh, efferent blood, blood comes in and then afferent blood leaves. And this is called the Bowman's capsule here. And then the capillary network where you, you have blood in small molecules moving out or you have Water and small molecules moving out of the blood is called the glomerulus. So the glomerulus is inside of the Bowman's capsule. And then you have the tubule where you have reabsorption of solid of water and solute occurring. And you have the proximal tubule, uh, which is nearest to the Bowman's capsule. You have the loop of Henle. You have the distal collecting tubule, or these are sometimes referred to as the proximal and distal convoluted collecting tubules because they're very twisty. And then you have the collecting duct, which then um, actually uh, several collecting come together to uh, the renal pyramids, and then they come together to form the pelvis, which then forms the ureter. All right. So you've got blood coming in, and then you've got a substance called filtrate that works its way through the proximal, uh, the loop of Henle, the distal collecting tubule. And then if, if eventually that filtrate um, after reabsorption becomes urine in the collecting tubule. So blood comes in, you've got filtrate in the middle and then urine coming out. All right. So again, major indications for uh, diuretics are going to be uh, hypertension management and uh, often diuresis, cause diuresis in patients that have fluid overload issues. All right. So let's talk about uh, some of these agents. So some of the most common agents that we run into and we can even use are the so-called loop diuretics. And they are called loop diuretics because they impact packed sodium transport in the ascending loop of Henle. So right here, next to the proximal tubule, it descends down into, deeper down into the kidney, all right, down into the, um, the uh, here, you got the tubule and the renal cortex. Um, so it descends down in the medulla, 
And then you have the ascending loop, which comes up and connects into the um, distal collecting tubule. Um, so these interfere with sodium transporters, which then keeps sodium inside the filtrate, which means water stays in the filtrate and you lose more water as urine. Because remember, wherever sodium goes, water follows. Um, fortunately, um, another problem associated with that is that you will also retain potassium ions in that filtrate and you tend to urinate out a lot of potassium ions. And so loop diuretics are what we call non patent sparing diuretics. So hypokalemia is a side effect of non potassium sparing diuretics like the loop diuretics. And oftentimes, somebody who is on a loop diuretic will also need to be on potassium supplements, potassium chloride, also known as KDOR. And these are large, um, these are large uh, tablets, you know, 10 milli equivalent, 20 milli equivalent tablets that people can take to supplement to prevent that. Some common examples of loop diuretics are uh, ferrosamide or Lasix. Bumetidine, also known as Bumex. Um, one thing that I will mention here is with uh, Bumex, if somebody has a sulfa allergy, there is a cross sensitivity. If they have a true sulfa allergy, not sulfur, but sulfa, all right, um, then Bumex would be generally contraindicated in those patients. As part of the chemical structure, Bumetidine it has a sulfa structure integrated into it, all right? Um, so these are the loop diuretics. And of course, we do have the ability to administer some of these, right? Uh, specifically ferrosamide. Um, and ferrosamide can be given orally, can also be given um, intravenously. If we were gonna be giving it, it would be typically in an intravenous fashion. Although I should say that giving diuretics outside of the hospital can be problematic because you can cause uh, fluid and electrolyte imbalances with these. And so it is typically pretty nice if um, you can actually monitor uh, the patient and know what their electrolyte status is uh, before you start dumping um, uh, diuretics into them. But some protocols for certain types of congestive heart failure exacerbations um, do call for the use of uh, ferrosamide. Uh, typically, uh, the typical dose is anywhere from what? 0 0.5 to 1 milligram per kilogram, very slow IV push over a couple of minutes. Um, or in some cases, what they will do is if the patient, say the patient's taking 40 milligrams of Lasix, say 40 milligrams uh, PO uh, every day, um, some guidelines suggest that you double that to, as an IV dose. So you give them 80 milligrams slow IV, which would be close to one milligram per kilogram, assuming an average sized patient. All right. Just remember that this you're giving this, this can impact the potassium. It can also impact uh, blood pressure as well. So I want to be careful there. All right, the next category of diuretics are what we call the thiazide diuretics or the thiazide-like di diuretics. And instead of the loop of Henle, they actually work in the distal convoluted tubule and they inhibit sodium and chloride reabsorption. So sodium chloride stays in the filtrate, which means you reabsorb water and more water leaves at the urine. Uh, these are also synergistic with loop diuretics in the congested heart failure patients. So it is quite common to see some of these patients on multiple diuretics, or they may be on combination drugs, different combinations of diuretics, or there are some drugs where you may have like a diuretic combined with a beta blocker or a diuretic combined with a calcium channel blocker or two different diuretics combined. 
those kinds of things are very common as well. So uh, the thiazides have some side effects associated with them. There is a risk of QT prolongation. All right. So you want to be very careful, particularly if you're looking at giving an antihistrhythmic to a patient that is on a thiazide or a thiazide-like diuretic. Right? If you're thinking about giving amiodarone or um, you're thinking um, about giving procainamide, right? something like that that is going to impact the QT interval, there may be um, an issue if, you're, if they're on a thiazide diuretic. Um, Thiazide diuretics can cause some glucose intolerance. So if somebody is having some glucose issues, maybe they have like a mild, mild diabetes, or they're kind of pre-diabetic, the monoizide may kind of push them over the edge and, and they may have more trouble controlling their blood sugar. So that's something to think about. These are also non-potassium sparing. So these patients, just like the, the loop diuretic patients will have a tendency to um, lose potassium. And there is an elevated risk of pancreatitis in some patients that are on thiazides. So that's another thing to think about. Um, the common example of a thiazide is something called hydrochlorothiazide. We often refer to it as HCTZ. All right, so those are the thiazide diuretics. All right, the third major category are some very specialized ones. And in fact, all the rest of these are fairly specialized, um, but these are what we call the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. This is the same carbonic anhydrase that we talked about in pathophysiology. Remember carbon dioxide combines with water molecules to form carbonic acid. And the enzyme that catalyzes that reaction is carbonic anhydrase. So what these do is these inhibit carbonic anhydrase, and that can do a couple of things. First of all, it can cause decreased sodium and bicarbonate reabsorption in the proximal tubule of the kidneys. So what does that mean? Well, that means that more sodium and bicarbonate ions stay in the filtrate, don't get reabsorbed back into the blood, but more water stays in there and you urinate more water off, all right? So what are some um, side effects of these? Well, first of all, their chemical structure has some similarities with sulfa antibiotics. And so if the patient has a sulfa allergy, carbonic and hydrase inhibitors may be contraindicated because of cross reactivities. The other thing is because you are losing bicarbonate ions, these will cause a mild metabolic acidosis. Putting somebody on a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor will cause a mild metabolic acidosis, which means that their respiratory rate will tend to increase as well as their tidal volume, their depth will tend to increase as a compensatory mechanism for that metabolic acidosis. These agents are used for fairly special situations such as glaucoma, where the intraocular pressure is elevated uh, for special types of intracranial hypertension, um, something called idiopathic intracranial hypertension, for example. And these agents are also used to treat altitude sickness or something called acute mountain sickness or AMS. And the life-threatening manifestations of acute man um, mountain sickness, high altitude pulmonary, um, oops, high altitude pulmonary edema or HAPE and high altitude cerebral edema, HACE. Um, and one of the ways that these can be helpful is because they do induce a mild metabolic acidosis um, at altitude, right? They help patients compensate for altitude sickness a little bit by um, having the patient's respiratory rate and depth of breathing increase a little bit. Um, so those are the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. The classic example of one is something called acetazolamide. 
also known as Dymox, the trade name. All right, next group of diuretics are what we call the potassium sparing diuretics. All right, and these, unlike the loop diuretics and the thiazides, actually cause you to hold on to potassium ions. All right, so potassium sparing diuretics work by increasing potassium reabsorption and decreasing sodium reabsorption in the collecting duct. So they don't work on the loop, they don't work on the distal tubule, but they actually work on receptors in the collecting ducts. All right. Um, aldosterone like receptors in the collecting ducts. So unlike the other diuretics, there's actually a risk for hyperkalemia with the potassium sparing diuretics versus hypokalemia with the thiazides and the loop diuretics. The major example, or actually there are a couple of major examples, spironolactone is a classic one, also known as autolactone, amiloride or midamore, all right, the trade name, all right? So those are just a couple of examples of potassium sparing diuretics. And then finally, we have what are called the osmotic diuretics. And the osmotic diuretics kind of work more in the, um, the glomerulus. And essentially what they do is they increase osmotic pressure in the nephron. So these osmotic diuretics um, are kind of large, large molecules that exert a lot of pressure and that pulls water. They can cross into the tubules and then that tends to pull water out and hold water in the tubules so more water gets eliminated as urine. Um, so they increase urinary flow due to that increase in osmotic pressure in the neuron, you know, in the front, excuse me. And the major indication for osmotic diuretics is to decrease intracranial pressure. So if somebody has cerebral edema, these may be used. And the classic example of an osmotic diuretic is something called mannitol. It is a modified sugar, modified mano sugar. Um, and the interesting thing about mannitol is it's given as a is an IV infusion, and it very prone to crystallize. So it needs to be given through a special filtered IV set, and it should be warmed. So you need to keep it on a warmer, otherwise it will um, crystallize even at room temperatures, right? So there's some special handling considerations when it comes to mannitol. Um, we used to carry this. And in fact, the, the flight crews may still carry it. I'm not sure, um, but we would carry it in our um, fluid warmers. Um, and I actually did administer it um, on a couple of occasions on people that had head injuries. But it's not used super frequently. Okay. So we're looking over the five major categories of diuretics. We've got the loop diuretics, the thiazide, the thiazide likes, the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, the potassium sparing, and the osmotics. Is everybody okay with the major categories of diuretics, what they're used for, and what the major um, side effects and considerations are going to be for those? Okay, chat looks good. All right, well, we'll continue on then. So the next class of drugs I wanna talk about, super common, and um, they also have diuretic effects. And these are the ACE inhibitors. And the ACE inhibitors stand for angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. So just to review, the renin, angiotensin aldosterone system, okay, because this is where these particular agents work, 
Remember, when your kidneys are not getting perfused, so your kidneys detect hypoperfusion, and that could be due to shock, uh, or it could be due to heart failure. The heart's not working well, um, and it's just not able to perfuse the kidneys. And so the kidneys that, and the kidney roots renin, right, in response to decreased perfusion. And then renin interacts with angiotensinogen, which is floating around in our blood, and converts angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. And then angiotensin 1 circulates through the lungs. And as it does, it comes into contact with an enzyme called angiotensin converting enzyme, which converts angiotensin 1 into its active form angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 goes on to do a few things. So first of all, angiotensin 2 can cause vasoconstriction, right, which will increase blood pressure potentially. Um, in addition to that, it will act upon the adrenal glands, cause the adrenal glands to release aldosterone, which then causes us to hold on to water, causes us to retain water. So it has an antidiuretic effect which will hopefully increase blood pressure, may increase afterload as well. And angiotensin II will act upon the central nervous system and you will have a release of antidiuretic hormone from the pituitary gland, which causes you to retain more water. Now, if this works and the blood pressure increases and the renal you know, perfusion increases, then it will quit releasing renin and then less angiotensinogen will be converted to angiotensin 1, and less angiotensin 1 will be converted to angiotensin 2, and so on and so forth. However, in a heart failure patient, what happens is they have heart failure, renin is released, angiotensin 2 is created, that causes you to retain water, increase afterload, which puts more stress on the heart, so the heart fails more, the kidneys get perfused less, they release more renin, the heart fails more, and there's this vicious cycle. And so ACE inhibitors are a very important component of treating congestive heart failure because they block the action of the ACE enzyme, which disrupts this vicious cycle that can lead to decompensation. These are also very effective as antihypertensive agents, so treating patients with high blood pressure. These are often the primary agent that we use. Um, and the reason that these are often primarily used is that unlike the beta blockers and unlike non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, the ACE inhibitors do not impact the heart rate, right? So if I'm an active person, if I'm a, a relatively active person, um, I may not want to go on a beta blocker. Even though a beta blocker can decrease my heart rate, the problem is um, my heart might not be able to respond to physical activity normally. So if, I, if I'm very active and I start exercising, that beta blocker may prevent my heart rate from increasing to respond and compensate for the increased demand I'm putting on my body, whereas the ACE inhibitors don't do that. And so they're a nice first option for treating blood pressure. And then if there are problems with the ACE inhibitors, um, or they're not very well tolerated, or they're not working as well as they should, then Oftentimes, what we will do is we will add additional agents. We'll add a beta blocker. We'll add a, a, a diuretic. And so you see people that have more complex hypertension or more complex heart failure might be on multiple blood pressure medications and multiple diuretics um, because the management of their underlying condition is much more complex. So ACE inhibitors will decrease blood pressure and because they decrease the antidiuretic effects and the aldosterone effects, they have a diuretic-like effect as well. Um, there are some side effects, rare side effects. 
of um, it's called angioedema and angioedema I remember is a swelling of your respiratory mucosa we see this in um, uh, we, we see this in anaphylaxis for example however the angioedema caused by ACE inhibitors is not due to the IgG response that we see with allergies and anaphylaxis. So if somebody develops life-threatening angioedema from an ACE inhibitor, epinephrine is not necessarily going to treat them. It's not going to be very effective like it would more conventional um, a more conventional anaphylactic reaction, right? Luckily, it's rare, but it's very difficult to treat. Um, it, typically, you just stop the ACE inhibitor and allow it to go down on its own. But if it's severe and life-threatening, right, epinephrine may not treat it. You, they, these people may need surgical airway management. In addition to this, if a patient has stenosis of the renal artery, right, narrowing stenotic um, renal artery, uh, ACE inhibitor may impact perfusion to that compromised kidney and it may cause a kidney injury or even renal failure. So that is a relative contraindication. In addition to this, um, ACE inhibitors can cause coughing. Um, and the, one of the most common side effects is a dry cough. And sometimes the coughing can be so disruptive that that patients just can't tolerate it and they have to go on something else. In addition to this, ACE inhibitors may also be used to prevent ventricular remodeling. And we talked about that with the beta blockers, right? That when somebody has an occlusive myocardial infarction, an OMI, that's kind of the newer term for, for a heart attack or for a tumor syndrome, remember their, the ventricular tissue remodel abnormally and that can lead to the development of heart failure and ventric ventricular dysfunction and heart failure. ACE inhibitors like uh, like the beta blockers may prevent some of that all remodeling and these are important agents to get somebody on who has had a heart attack. Um, and in fact these agents belong on the um, the, uh, the acute coronary syndrome uh, core measure. Does anyone know what a core measure is or what core measures are? Have you ever heard of the, that term before? No, sir. No. Okay. So this is an important term. So core measures are specific guidelines that need to be followed in the setting of certain, uh, certain diagnoses, okay? For example, um, if somebody is having a heart attack and they come into the hospital, we'll pull the core measure for an acute coronary syndrome. And it says this, 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 and this, this, these things need to be done within this time frame. And it just so happens that within, I think it's within 24 hours, of the uh, of the myocardial infarction, um, patients need to be placed on ACE inhibitor and beta blocker. Um, that's that that's one of the things that needs to happen. Uh, another common core measure to run into is is sepsis and septic shock, right? And you know, one part of that is going to be fluids, right? These patients need fluids, and within a certain time frame, they need antibiotics. Right? So that's what core measures are. All right. Uh, so some examples of ACE inhibitors, some common ones are the PRILs. They end with P-R-I-L, so enelapril, also known as Vasotec, lisinopril, also known as Zesterol. Those are common examples. Now, if the ACE inhibitors are not tolerated, there is another class of agents that essentially do the same thing, um, and these are called the ARBs, and that stands for angiotensin receptor blocker. So they don't block the ACE enzyme, but rather they block a receptor for angiotensin. So they still block the action of angiotensin. Um, so they, they act very uh, similar. 
but they don't have some of the side effects that you see with uh, the ACE inhibitors. Uh, these include things like Losartan, also known as Ozar, and Valsartan, also known as Diavan, and you see that these end with, with TAN, right? So you can kind of, these the ending, the, at least for the generic version of these drugs, can be helpful, right? So PRIL, you just think of as an ACE inhibitor, right? Uh, TAN, you think of a, an ARB. Um, LOL, you think of as a beta blocker, right? And so on and so forth. So those are just helpful things to help you think of the class of agents. All right, so those are the ACE inhibitors. And before we move further down the line, let me ask you all a question. What do you think about treating, treating hypertension in the pre-hospital environment? What do you all think about that? I think it may help the patient. I think it's something we should try to do. Maybe. I think it's a uh, very volatile because it can affect the, I mean, all these, uh, Isonerators and all, all the things that the patients take, you uh, you treat that and then you cause ionic shifts, and I think it's a uh, it needs to be in a controlled environment. So the general rule of thumb, there are some exceptions to this. But the general rule of thumb is we do not we do not treat hypertension in the pre-hospital environment. The, the general rule of thumb, okay? The reason being is if you, you have somebody with high blood pressure and you drop their blood pressure, that may lead to hypoperfusion. And this is something um, that we uh, that we sometimes call downstream ischemia or watershed ischemia, right? And so if you have somebody who is, who is hypertensive and um, they have atherosclerosis and arterial, arterial sclerosis, um, what can happen is over time, they kind of, their capillary networks become accustomed to those high pressures. And then if you drop that pressure, what happens is you have a sudden loss of blood flow through the capillaries and that can cause this ischemia to occur, particularly in the brain, right? Um, it can hit the brain, it can hit the kidneys, it can hit the heart, it can hit the vital organs. This is what we call watershed ischemia. Um, so typically we don't treat hypertension in the pre-hospital environment for that reason. And because sometimes hypertension is a compensatory mechanism. For example, if somebody has had a head injury or they have um, bleeding in their head or they have a tumor that's putting pressure on something, their body may be compensating, maybe trying to perfuse the brain by increasing the blood pressure. And so if we come along and we decrease the blood pressure, we could actually exacerbate that underlying, um, that underlying neurological problem. Now, there are some exceptions to that, some very special cases that we'll talk about later on, but things like um, if somebody is having a, an aortic dissection, for example, right, or the intimal layer of the aorta, it, the, uh, the inner layer, right, um, tunica intima has been torn, and it's dissecting, right? And maybe it is breached through and they are leaking blood out of their aorta into their mediastinum, right? They have a torn aorta. Um, in patients like that, we may wanna aggressively get their blood pressure down to certain um, guidelines, aggressively lower their heart rate. Um, and we're doing that is a kind of, of a, a salvage procedure, if you will, um, to buy them some time to get them into the um, operating room so that can be uh, repaired or replaced, right? So there are some special situations like that, but it is a general rule of thumb. We want to avoid treating hypertension 
in the pre-hospital environment because there, it's a very complicated minefield that you kind of have to tiptoe through. All right. So with that in mind, let's talk about another class of agents that can be used to treat hypertension, but they also have many other indications, uh, particularly from a pre-hospital context. And these include the nitrates. So the nitrates as a large or as a category of drugs work, the, the, the underlying mechanism of action of the nitrates is by increasing a free radical actually. They call it, they increase or activate a free radical nitric oxide, not nitrous oxide, but nitric oxide. And increasing nitric oxide levels has some downstream effects, but ultimately they cause vasodilation. So they don't cause diesis like diuretic, um, they cause vasodilation, but the mechanism of vasodilation is very different from say something like an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. Now, with that in mind, there are other classes of drugs that also increase nitric oxide levels in your body. And a common one are what are known as the phosphodiesterase type five inhibitors or the PDE5 inhibitors. These are commonly referred to as erectile dysfunction medications. So when the phosphodiesterase type five enzyme is inhibited, that will also increase nitric oxide levels, right? So medications like uh, teldenafil or Cialis, sildenafil or Viagra, right? You can have um, fairly substantial synergistic reactions between the phosphodiesterase inhibitors and the nitrates. And so it's generally indicated to give somebody nitrate if they have been on a phosphodiesterase inhibitor in the last 24 hours or so, right? So that's something that we need to ask about in the history. And um, sometimes I've, I've heard people say, are you on any sexual enhancement medications? Um, and that's, I guess that's a, an okay question, but if somebody says yes, well, then you got to go, well, what kinds of medications? Because there are lots of things out there that may be used for sexual enhancement that are not phosphodiesterase inhibitors, right? There's um, there's all kinds of, uh, of gas station stuff you can get that may or may not contain uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, right? There's, you know, Long Jack and um, all these other kinds of um, um, herbal supplements. And in fact, that's an entire different minefield when it comes to uh, uh, herbal supplements, over-the-counter supplements, and there are lots of interactions that can occur with those as well. So it is also important to ask about those um, in addition to um, other, other questions. All right, so that's the basic mechanism of action of nitrates. So let's talk about two specific kinds of nitrates that we run into, the most common one being nitroglycerin or NTG. Um, outside of the United States, it's actually called GTN. And that's the chemical name for nitroglycerate, that's glycerol trinitrate. So it's a glycerol molecule, three nitrates attached to it, right? Here in the U.S., we call it NTG or nitroglycerin. And so essentially what happens is nitroglycerin, uh, when it gets into your body, it actually forms, um, directly forms a free radical nitric oxide. And then nitric oxide is on to activate an enzyme called cyclase, And then that enzyme catalyzes the conversion of or the production of a molecule called cyclic GMP or CGMP. And it is this increase in CGMP that actually acts upon smooth muscle in the vessels and leads to vasodilation. 
right? Specifically, venodilation when it comes to nitroglycerin. So this is very good at dialing the veins. Um, let me ask you a question. Why? I, what's the primary reason we give nitroglycerin to somebody having chest pain, either anginal chest pain or chest pain um, that may be associated with an acute myocardial infarction or an occlusive myocardial infarction? What's the prime? Why, why, why do we give that? What, what's, what's it primarily doing? To increase the oxygenation in the myocardium. How though? How is it doing that? The vasodilates the coronary arteries. Ah, ha, ha. that's what everybody thinks, right? Guess what? Start to read this preload. There you go. Okay, yeah. So the dilate of coronary arteries is actually a very minor component of what nitroglycerin does. You're not really dilating the coronary arteries substantially. What you're doing is you are dilating the veins. And when you dilate the veins, what that does is that decreases the amount of blood coming to the heart. So remember, blood comes into the right side of the heart from the inferior and superior vena cava, right? Which is your vein at venous. Your veins drain into your vena cava. And then your vena cava brings blood to your right atrium. And then the right atrium fills the right ventricle and then the right ventricle pumps the blood to the lungs. And then that blood goes to the left atrium and into the left ventricle and out to the body through the aortic arch and the ascending and descending, or uh, the aortic arch and the de descending aorta. All right. So what nitroglycerin does is it decreases the blood coming into the right side of the heart. So there's less blood coming to the heart is what we call preload. The amount of blood that's coming in and preloading. So it decreases preload, which decreases the work the heart has to do. If the heart doesn't have to work as hard because it's not getting as much blood, then that will decrease oxygen consumption and increase oxygen supply. And that will subsequently, hopefully, decrease the amount of pain somebody's having. So that's the primary reason why we're giving nitroglycerin to somebody with uh, chest pain, either anginal or associated with an acute, uh, an acute coronary syndrome, ACS, also known as an uh, occlusive myocardial infarction or OMI. All right. Um, now. Nitroglycerin is also used to treat congestive heart exacerbation, a very special kind, a common kind of CHF exacerbation called SCAPE. And SCAPE stands for Sympathetic Crashing Acute Pulmonary Edema. So this is that hypertensive congestive heart failure patient that has crackles everywhere, they're tachycardic, their blood pressure is really high, they're full of fluid, and what do you do? You give them nitroglycerin that vasodilates them out. Less blood is coming into the heart. So the heart doesn't have to work so hard, right? And the patient feels a lot better. You also are giving the patient um, CPAP or sometimes BiPAP. And CPAP and BiPAP does the same thing, right? You're increasing the pressure in the chest. That's putting pressure on the right side of the heart which is decreasing the amount of blood coming into the right side of the heart and the heart doesn't have to work as hard, right? So that's why nitroglycerin and CPAP are so important when it comes to treating um, the skate manifestation of congestive heart failure. Um, nitroglycerin can be given several ways. Oftentimes it is given sublingually, right? 0 0.4 milligram aliquots. It can be given topically as well um, as a paste. And there's actually um, a special patch that you measure it in inches, typically in half an inch segments, and you'll put paste out on half an inch, half an inch, an inch. And then you'll put that, you'll label that patch, date it, time it, and put it on the patient. 
for topical absorption if you want more sustained. And nitroglycerin can also be given as a drip. It can be given as an IV infusion. And it's actually commonly given as an IV infusion. Because as an IV fusion, you can actually titrate the effects. All right. So what I want to do is I just want to talk about the nitroglycerin as an infusion a little bit. Um, so for giving it, typically it will pre um, it'll become prepared uh, in a glass jar. So instead of using a bag, it actually comes in a glass jar. And so if you are giving nitro pre-mixed nitro in a glass jar, you need to use special what we call vented IV tubing. You need to use a vented IV uh, set, 60 drop tubing for that. Otherwise it'll be very hard um, to get your infusion going, all right? Um, your typical dose of nitroglycerin, if you're giving it as an IV infusion, uh, tends to vary quite a bit. But typically what you're going to do is you're going to start anywhere from 10 to 20 micrograms per minute. And then you will titrate. You'll titrate up for effect. So you're going to watch the patient's blood pressure and you're going to monitor their pain that they're having. You're going to titrate that infusion up and and there's really like no maximum dose. I mean, you could go up to, you know, 50, 100, 150, maybe even 200 micrograms a minute. And as long as their blood pressure is okay, pressure holding fine and tolerating it, you can, you can go up to fairly high doses of nitroglycerin very safely. Um, typically, if you're gonna mix it, the standard mixture for nitroglycerin is 25 milligrams in 250 milliliters, all right? And essentially what that comes to is every five micrograms per minute is equal to three drops per minute or three milliliters per hour, right? So if you wanna do 10 mic micrograms a minute, you just have six drops a minute. 15 would be nine. 20 would be 12 and so on and so forth. So you're just titrating the rate by three drops per minute. So nitro drip is very easily titratable. Um, and its duration of actions is fairly short. So you can kind of right, shut it off if you, you run into a problem. And the biggest problem with nitroglycerin tends to be hypotension, right? So you need to have an adequate blood pressure before you get it. Um, okay, it's already 930. So let's go ahead and look at taking our first break. Any questions? Anybody have any questions? Okay, uh, I've got 933. So let's meet back up at 945, 945. Okay, we're back. Um, I actually got a question over the break. So um, let me just go ahead and address that because actually it's a really good one. Um, so the question is in, in reference to vasodilation. So it asks about how does dilation of veins decrease uh, the amount of blood returning to the heart? Um, it would seem that the bigger the vein becomes, the more blood would return. So a way, a way that you can conceptualize this, it's not a perfect analogy, but think about a hose. So you have a garden hose, right? And if you put your, your thumb over the hose, what happens? So you, and, and that's kind of the equivalent of, of squeezing it down a little bit. Well, what happens is the pressure increases quite a bit and you have a lot, and the, the pressure and the flow increases, right? So it's coming out faster, a lot higher pressure, right? And then when you take your thumb away, what happens is it decreases and the pressure's a lot lower and the flow isn't as high. That is essentially what you're doing when you give a nitrate and you're dilating out the veins, right? You dilate out the veins because the amount of fluid is in the, in the container isn't changing, right? Unless you're adding a lot to it. But, you know, you, so you have a relatively unchanging amount of fluid. So what you do when you vasodilate, right, is 
you're taking that pressure down, right? And then the flow coming through the veins, remember veins bring blood back to the heart. So you're dilating these veins out, you're increasing the size of the container and that's decreasing the pressure and decreasing the flow of the blood in the venous system. So what does that mean? Well, that means that less blood is getting to the heart and it is at a lower pressure. Um, so hopefully that intuitively explains what, what's going on there. Um, this is exactly why somebody in anaphylactic shock, for example, why their blood pressure gets low because their blood vessels begin dilating out, right? Um, you're doing that in a much more controlled manner with nitroglycerin, but the mechanism um, is, is very similar. Um, and then the other part of that is, um, wouldn't less output be bad for the body as a whole? Yeah, um, so there's a balance. So um, that's why there is a blood pressure guideline for um, nitroglycerin, right? Um, your blood pressure needs to be above 100 millimeters systolic, or you can't give nitroglycerin. So if somebody is hypotensive and you give them nitroglycerin, then you essentially um, are causing too much. Uh, uh, you're, you're causing too, aggress a too aggressive decrease in preload, and then that will adversely impact um, the ability for the heart to perfuse or for the heart to perfuse the body. So this is a real, this real delicate balancing act that we're doing. So if you decrease preload too much, then yeah, the cardiac output is going to decrease to the point where you compromise perfusion. Um, so it's this balance that is kind of this delicate balance going on. Um, so hopefully that explains it. Um, and as, as far as during a heart attack, um, so yeah, you don't want to decrease the blood pressure too much. Um, so essentially you want to take some of the workload off the heart, right? So it's not getting as much blood. It's not having to work as hard, but if you do it to the point where now there's no blood coming into the heart, then obviously that's going to cause harm. Um, so it's a real, real delicate balancing act. And that's why there's kind of that hard stop of blood pressure. And if the patient's blood pressure is not above hundred systolic, um, you would not want to give nitroglycerin or you would not want to give any drug that would decrease the preload any further. And in fact, there are special kinds of heart attacks where nitroglycerin is harmful or potentially harmful. And you're going to learn about them in ECG interpretation here in a few weeks. So um, there are actually special kinds of heart attacks where this reduction in preload is harmful to the patient. Um, so not even all pay people having heart attacks um, get nitroglycerin or should get nitroglycerin. Um, and hopefully that will become a little more evident as we actually start talking about, because you, you all, you're going to learn about the various types of heart attacks, like the coronary artery involved, the wall, of the heart that's perfused, what happens when that wall dysfunctions, what does it look like on a 12 ECG? What are the clinical manifestations? We're actually going to take a very deep dive into all of that. And so hopefully it will all start um, making a lot more sense. So hopefully, um, hopefully I answered that question. That's a really good question. Um, okay. Make sure I'm clear out on chat. All right, excellent. Well, let's move on. Uh, so we talked about nitroglycerin. So let's now move on and let's talk about one of the other major nitrates. And I'll go ahead and uh, go into screen record here so you all can see. The other major nitrate that we occasionally run into is something called sodium nitroprusside or nifride. There we go. So sodium nitroprusside, its mechanism of action is slightly different. Ultimately, it's the same mechanism of action involving nitric oxide, but it gets there in a slightly different way. So essentially what sodium nitroprusside is, 
This is also known as nipride, also known as nipride, or just nitroprusside. Um, is essentially you have a molecule of ferrous oxide, um, iron oxide, that is in a ferrous state. And we'll talk about ferrous versus ferric here in just a minute. Um, so you have a molecule of ferrous oxide um, that is bound to nitric oxide. And what happens is when that molecule, that sodium nitroprusside molecule, begins to interact with proteins in your blood, uh, specifically the sulfhydryl groups, these are um, sulfur and hydrogen containing groups um, on the proteins within your blood. So think of like albumin and on the uh, proteins on the surfaces of red blood cells um, that liberates the nitric oxide. So the nitric oxide gets liberated from the ferrous oxide and nitric oxide gets released. Um, so ultimately it, it's still nitric oxide and then that goes on to activate um, uh, guanylate cyclase and that goes on to increase CGMP, which then causes um, smooth muscle relaxation in vascular structures. So what are some things to know about sodium nitroprusside? Well, first of all, it's very rapid acting, rapid onset, short duration of action. Um, so it is very easy to titrate. And this is one that is given as an IV infusion. However, it is very photosensitive. So it tends to break down in light. And so when you mix sodium nitroprusside, you actually, there's actually in the package insert, there's a foil package and you have to actually put the foil over the IV mix the bag, you mix it in, you have to surround it in that foil to prevent light from getting in there and breaking the molecule up. Um, and there is a risk particularly if you're giving it in very high doses for some of the metabolites of this molecule to be cyanide-like. So you have cyanide-like metabolites and this can also cause something referred to as methemoglobinemia. So methemoglobin is an abnormal form of hemoglobin. And you can potentially cause methemoglobinemia with sufficiently large doses of nitroglycerin as well. Uh, but this is, is more problem with sodium nitroprusside. But anytime you are dealing with lots of nitric oxide, um, you can cause methemoglobinemia. So what is methemoglobinemia? Well, it is an abnormal form of hemoglobin. So normally the hemoglobin, um, so at the center of a hemoglobin molecule, you have an iron atom, and then that iron atom is coordinated with lots of nitrogens. So you've got nitrogens um, on the sides here, these nitrogen atoms, and they have electrons on them to kind of stabilize the iron in place. And then iron's connected down at the bottom by a, an amino acid a residue. And so the very top part is open for the oxygen to come in and coordinate with it. Um, and normally iron exists within what's known as a ferrous state. It's ferrous state. So it is an iron with a plus two. So Fe plus two. So that means it's iron that has lost two electrons. Met hemoglobin. What happens with met hemoglobin is an electron gets taken away, an extra electron gets stolen from the iron. Instead of Fe plus two, it gets converted into Fe plus three, or what we call its ferric state. And ferric iron in hemoglobin is what we call met hemoglobin. And this form of hemoglobin does not transport oxygen effectively. So it is essentially poisoned hemoglobin. And there are many different drugs that can do this. Sodium uh, nitrates, nitrates in general can do this. There's some other nitrates like um, anitrate and alkyl nitrate, um, which are not commonly used 
therapeutically, um, but sometimes they're used as drugs of abuse. Um, they're sometimes referred to as poppers, if you've ever heard of that term poppers, um, where you would actually, um, they kind of come in like little smelling salt packages and you pop them and then you'd smell them. And, and essentially what happens is you get this huge head rush because you have all this vasodilation. You get this big head rush and you feel really weird. And those are called hemonotric poppers. It's a common, um, common thing to do uh, uh, back in the day, several decades ago. It's not as com Nitrates are not as commonly used in that way anymore. Um, but that's because you're getting that vasodilation. Um, but one of the side effects, again, is met hemoglobinemia. So if somebody has met hemoglobinemia, we need to be able to convert the ferric iron back into the ferrous iron. And does anyone know what the antidote for met hemoglobinemia is? Anybody know? No, sir. No? Okay. Um, so it is a drug called methylene blue. Methylene blue. And it is very blue. <laughs> it's actually sometimes used as a, as a dye or a stain. Um, and when you give somebody methylene blue, essentially what it does is it can donate. It has an electron that it can donate to that iron to convert it back into its ferrous state so it can transport oxygen again. Um, so the, the antidote for met hemoglobinemia is methylene blue. Um, and there are uh, other things that can cause this. Many of the local anesthetics can cause met hemoglobinemia. For example, um, there are certain types of sprays um, that can cause this. And we'll probably get into them here a little later on in the pharmacology class. But local anesthetics and nitrates are your common sources of um, met hemoglobinemia. Now, on the other end, um, let's talk about cyanide toxicity. So cyanide toxicity, cyanide is a carbon and a nitrogen. And it is often... Um, associated with either hydrogen, we call that hydrogen cyanide, or sometimes potassium, we call that potassium cyanide, um, and then other cyanide light mole molecules and metabolites. But main, typically what cyanide does is it actually interferes with the electron transport. And specifically what it does is it coordinates with the iron in some of the enzymes, some of those proteins um, in the electron transport because the electrons are shifting through those proteins very rapidly. And so those proteins are, um, the iron, those proteins are shifting between ferrous and state very, very rapidly. And so they're much more prone to being attacked by cyanide, so to speak. Um, but essentially what cyanide does is it shuts down cytochrome C oxidase and prevents the cells from using oxygen. So these uh, cyanide is an intracellular toxin that causes um, hypoxia at a cellular level. So even though you may have oxygen in your blood, that oxygen cannot be utilized by the electron transport. And that's what makes cyanide so toxic. Um, so does anyone have what the antidote for cyanide toxicity is? Uh, hydroxocobalamin. Good, hydroxocobalamin. Good, hydroxocobalamin. Um, there is another antidote, um, but it's not as commonly used and it's not a part of New Mexico's uh, scope of practice, but I want to mention it because it, you know, it's still out there and it actually involves several steps. 
So if the first step is you poison, you actually poison the patient's hemoglobin. And you do that by giving the patient high doses of nitrates. Right, so you have someone with cyanide toxicity, and oftentimes this comes from fires, right? Um, from combustion, so smoke inhalation, um, where you have lots of synthetics that are burning, right? That's where you get tend to get cyanide, and then you can get cyanide in industrial settings, mines, and things of that nature. Um, so what you do is you have to poison the patient's hemoglobin. So essentially what you do is you give them large doses of nitrates, typically something like amyl nitrate. And then you might even give them an infusion of sodium nitrate. And essentially what these do is these convert a large amounts of the patient's hemoglobin into ferric hemoglobin. So you are creating, you are causing met hemoglobinemia in patient. So you poison their hemoglobin, and then the cyanide has a higher affinity for that poisoned hemoglobin. So the cyanide will attach to the hemoglobin, right? And then it can eventually get eliminated. But now what you have is you have somebody with poisoned hemoglobin, so you need to treat that, right? So then what you'll do is you'll have to give methylene blue to treat the poison hemoglobin to treat the met hemoglobinemia that you yet you created. <laughs> so you can see it's a it's it's a complicated thing, and you're having to you're having to bag the patient, you're having to ventilate the patient. And you have these little amyl nitrate pearls that you're cracking, shaking up. They're basically like smelling salts. You stick that in the bag valve mask, and you bag that in. Typically, while you're doing CPR, because this is a critical patient and severe cyanide uh, toxicity is uh, pretty nasty. Right. And then you're you're doing that and then you're having to give methylene blue versus just giving a dose of hydroxocobalamin, which is just a vitamin. Right. It's just a B vitamin. It's very safe. Um, it does interfere with lab tests. Um, turns your urine a really interesting yellowish um, orange color. Um, it's very safe otherwise. Um, and what the dose of hydroxycobalamin is. Also known as vitamin B12. Five grams over 30 minutes. Oh, where'd you get that from? I totally just knew it. Just kidding. It was from the New Mexico. No, it was from the New Mexico drug cards. Right out of the scope of practice. Yeah. So essentially what you do is you have an ampule of it. Um, like either typically like a glass ampule is how I, I see it. And you've got five grams of it's vitamin B12. You got five grams and you just pull that up. You put it in a hundred mils and then you just give it as a, as a piggyback. Um, and, and you're basically giving it very similar to like you would with, with Phenergan or promethazine like we did yesterday in lab. Um, and the hydroxycobalamin actually has a cobalt molecule in it. And that cobalt is actually what attracts the cyanides attracted to the cobalt. So it attaches to that. And then it produces um, a, an inert substance called cyanocobalamin. And then it just gets eliminated in the urine. So hydroxycobalamin is a much better option for treating cyanide poisoning. Um, so those were kind of some asides, but still those were some drugs that I wanted to talk about nonetheless. Um, if we're giving sodium nitroprusside, they tend to recommend the patient has an arterial line placed. Does anyone know what an arterial line or an art line is? Have you ever heard of that? Line inserted directly into the into an artery instead of a vein. Exactly what it is, um, and in general, there are almost no medications that you can give through an arterial line. In fact, 
giving any medicine into an arterial line is generally disastrous. There are very few exceptions like strange, like a hydrofluoric acid poisoning. So if somebody got hydrofluoric acid um, poured on, you know, like a hand or an arm, um, the, the hydrofluoric acid um, of fight ions act um, pull calcium out and can cause life-threatening hypoxemia. And so sometimes you might need to inject calcium directly into, into an artery to try to preserve the limb or preserve life. Um, so, you know, really rare situations like that. But generally speaking, the only reason you're putting a um, line into an artery is to monitor a patient's blood pressure. And there's a whole special setup that goes along with that. Um, it's called transducing and there's special IV tubing that you need to use. And then there's a little transducer that needs to be leveled um, at some, at, at a very specific level of the patient's heart called the phlebostatic axis. And it, then it goes into a special monitor and it gives you this real time. It's really cool. It gives you a real time beat by beat blood pressure. So instead of having to wait, right, instead of, you know, cycling the non-invasive blood pressure, right, every time the patient's heart beats, you have a blood pressure real time. And so you can instantly see that when their blood pressure goes up and down in real time, and they recommend that you have this in place when you are giving somebody sodium nitroprusside to titrate their blood pressure. Um, and so you can do very, very accurate titration with this. Um, now, again, Pre-hospitalized, we tend not to want to rapidly reduce blood pressure, if at all, but there are special situations like an aortic dissection um, where we might need to rapidly reduce blood pressure and really reduce heart rate into specific guidelines to keep that dissection from getting worse and to try to preserve that patient's life long enough for them to, to uh, make it into an operating room. Um, so those are the uh, nitrates. Any questions? Any questions over the nitrates so far? Okay, excellent. So now what I want to do is that I want to move on to talking about some other classes of cardiovascular agents, and these are the anticoagulants, antiplatelet agents, very commonly used. Uh, lots of people will prescribe them. They're used a lot in the uh, hospital and sometimes pre-hospital setting as well. So what do we need to know about these categories of agents in general? Well, what I want you to know, first of all, is that these are drugs that do not break down clots. All right. So anticoagulants and antiplatelets do not break down clots, but rather they prevent the formation of new clots. All right. So why would somebody be on an anticoagulant or an antiplatelet? Well, the major indications are going to be if somebody has had or is at risk for something called a DVT, a deep vein thrombosis, because what is the life-threatening problem associated with the deep vein thrombosis? What do you all think? The an embolus. <clears throat> The pulmonary embolism, yeah, that so that DVT breaks off, right, and it's in the vein, it's in a deep vein, and where do all veins go for the most part? They all go back to the heart, and so that clot that you have a um, a clot uh, from it, that's what it is, is a clot. It breaks a part of it breaks off, it gets pumped to the right side of the heart, goes for the right atrium, right ventricle, and then gets pumped into the lungs, and then it causes a pulmonary embolism, yeah. Um, so PE risk, um, occlusive myocardial infarction, right? OMI, or sometimes this is referred to as an ACS, an acute coronary syndrome, where you have a sudden occlusion of a coronary artery. If somebody has had a procedure called PCI, does anyone know what PCI is? Does anyone know what PCI is? No. 
No. So PCI stands for percutaneous. So you're going through the skin. Coronary. In reference to the coronary arteries, intervention. Percutaneous coronary intervention. That's PCI. So PCI is a procedure that involves a couple of different procedures. All right. So the first thing that it involves is you percutaneously insert a large catheter into an artery, typically the radial artery of the wrist, if we can. Sometimes um, we have to go the femoral artery, but the radial artery is nice. Complication rates tend to be low there. They have lots of vascular disease. You may have to go to the femoral artery. All right. And then you will thread a wire all the way up the aortic root. That's where the aorta comes off the top of the heart, All right? And then what you will do is you will inject contrast. So contrast will get injected and then that contrast will get taken up by the coronary arteries and that contrast it typically has iodine in it and it's very good at absorbing x-rays. And so you will do a special kind of x-ray, a real-time x-ray, all right, um, with something called a C-arm. And as you might imagine, this is done in a cath lab. And the first thing that will be done is something called an angiogram. So you thread that catheter in there and you shoot contrast onto the aortic root. And you should see all of the coronary arteries darken, should become dark because blood is flowing through them and that blood has that contrast in it and it's absorbing the x-rays. And so all the coronary arteries will become dark and that tells you that you, you have perfusion throughout the heart. If there's area where it isn't dark, then tell you there's no perfusion and that tells you where the blockage is, right? So you'll do an angiogram first. And then what you'll do is you'll find, so you find the blockage with the angiogram and then you go in and you take a, a little balloon in there and you open the vessel up. So you slide a deflated balloon into that vessel that's occluded and then you inflate the balloon and that opens the blood vessel up. And that is called balloon angioplasty. All right, so you do the angiogram to find the occlusion. You do the angioplasty to open the blood vessel back up. And then what you'll do is you will place the device to prevent the blood vessel from closing back off. And that is called a stent. So that is what PCI involves. Most people will say, oh, PCI equals stent. But it's a little more complicated than that. It equals angiogram plus angioplasty plus stent. So anybody who has had a PCI procedure will also be on an anticoagulant and or antiplatelet agent. And then if it had a heart valve replaced, um, they might be on this as these various agents as well. So these are some of the major indications. So let's just talk about the most commonly used one in a pre-hospital context, and this is aspirin. Aspirin is actually used for many things. Um, the major mechanism of action of aspirin is it is a non-selective COX inhibitor. COX is the cyclooxygenase enzyme. If you remember back from pathophysiology, when your mast cells degranulate, they essentially rupture and there is a chemical left in the mast cell walls called arachidonic acid. And when arachidonic acid comes into contact with cyclooxygenase enzymes, arachidonic acid gets converted into prostaglandins. And there are two subtypes. There's cyclooxygenase 1 and cyclooxygenase 2. And these enzymes catalyze for the production of different kinds of prostaglandins. Um, in addition to that, 
there's another group of molecules called thromboxanes that are produced, thromboxones that are produced. And these are important because these chemicals are involved in platelet activation. Okay. So the prostaglandins are involved in pain, inflammation, right? So that's where the um, analgesic and the anti-inflammatory properties of aspirin come, right? Inhibiting prostaglandins, but inhibiting thrombaxones um, will inhibit platelet aggregation prevent platelets from clumping together. So aspirin is aptly called an antiplatelet agent, all right? Um, some of the major side effects, however, um, prostaglandins are a very important part of maintaining the GI mucosa. And so when somebody is on aspirin, particularly for an extended period of time, they can have um, a, an elevated risk for um, erosions of the GI mucosa. They can get ulcers or peptic ulcer, peptic ulcers, or some ulcers in the upper part of the um, small intestine. Uh, in addition to this, there is a rare disease that can occur, and this tends to be in kids with viral infections. And for some reason, it's not well understood, but shot children to, uh, under the age of 17 who receive aspirin are, are going to be at a higher risk for developing this. Uh, it's called Eyes syndrome. And essentially what it is, is a kind of, um, it's a kind of devastating liver failure. Like the, the liver um, rapidly uh, turns to fat and it gets inflamed, um, causes uh it causes hepatic encephalopathy, coagulopathies, frank liver failure. It can be very fatal, very nasty. In fact, um, my mother, uh, one mother's friends, uh, when she was a little girl, died of Rye syndrome um, back when we were just kind of figuring this, this out, that there is, a, there is an association with aspirin Rye syndrome. So that's why aspirin is contraindicated in patients who are less than 17. It's contraindicated in patients who have a history of bleeding ulcers or who are actively bleeding, but it is commonly used in the setting of a suspected occlusive myocardial infarction. That tends to be the primary indication for us. If, uh, you know, these sessions. In fact, aspirin, we researched it, aspirin is the only intervention that has been shown to decrease mortality when given in the pre-hospital environment. So if somebody is having a heart attack, all these other drugs that we learn, nitroglycerin and, and, and oxygen in some, some cases, um, and you know all these other anticoagulants, uh, all that stuff. Aspirin is the only one that has been shown to actually decrease mortality in patients if given in the pre, if given by pre-hospital providers. So aspirin truly is a, a very important uh, part of managing these patients because of of the benefits associated with it. Okay, so that's aspirin. Uh, the next medication I want to talk about is something called Coumadin. We've talked about this before, also known as warfarin. And this works not by in, in inhibiting platelet aggregation, but again, this works by decreasing vitamin K synthesis. It actually inhibits an enzyme that is responsible for um, cycling vitamin K. And we know that vitamin K is a very important cofactor for clotting. And so when we hit it, vitamin K synthesis, um, this actually causes a, um, uh, has a, an anticoagulant effect. So it prevents blood clotting. Uh, the problem with Coumadin or Warfarin is that there are multiple drug interactions with it. 
Um, and with all of these antiplatelet, anticoagulant agents, there's always going to be a bleeding risk. Doesn't matter. Um, so you just want to apply that to all of these. And so if there's trauma or head injury, right, the risk for that being worse than anticipated is, is elevated. Um, but if somebody on Coumadin is having bleeding, there are some antidotes that will reverse Coumadin overdose or Coumadin toxicity, uh, specifically giving the patient vitamin K, also known as aquamephitin, will do it. And giving the patient fresh frozen plasma will also reverse Coumadin overdose. Um, and as an interesting aside, Coumadin, does anyone know where Coumadin is commonly used outside of, a, of an anticoagulant bowl? Does anyone know where it's commonly used? Hyperkalemia? No, no. It's actually commonly used as a rat poison, a rat or a rodent poison. It's one of the big uses for Coumadin. The little pellets, the rat eats it. And then what happens, the, the, the rat develops coagulopathy or the, the, the mouse um, and it, it dies of, of internal hemorrhage. In fact, it has been used so much that many of the rats and mice have evolved over the past several decades, have actually evolved resistance <laughs> to the effects of Coumadin. And so some of the newer um, agents that are out there, rat and mice poison, actually have reformulated versions of Coumadin. These are called super, sometimes referred to as super orphan or super Coumadin. These are highly toxic, very powerful vitamin K synthesis inhibitors to, um, to kill off these rats that are resistant to the OG Coumadin. Um, and I bring up because there have been several instances of um, drugs that have been contaminated with this super Coumadin. Some really big instances uh, a few years ago of people coming into emergency rooms, dying of, of internal hemorrhage and, and intracranial hemorrhage, bleeding inside of their, their cranium, their head. Um, and they were using synthetic cannabinoids. You know, things like K2, Spice, and others, these highly potent synthetic cannabinoids have been contaminated with um, or uh, you know, either accidentally or intentionally contaminated with uh, the, these super cumin or super warp compounds. And there were lots of people poisoned. Some people died. In fact, there is a, um, we have just seen a new batch of people uh, that have come down with this in recent uh, weeks. And so there's fear of a, maybe another epidemic of this occurring. Um, so that does happen from time to time. And the, um, the half-life can be very long on these agents. And so some of these patients we need to monitor, even after they treat them, uh, we need to monitor them for you know, a couple months in some cases to make sure they don't you know, internally bleed. Um, so the toxicity risk with Coumadin is very high. And so typically somebody who's on Coumadin will have to have their blood drawn at least weekly. And these are sometimes referred to as Coumadin clinics. There's a, there's a whole section of the Memorial Medical Center that is just um, focusing on drawing blood uh, from people that are on Coumadin. And they just come in, they get their blood drawn, and they're just looking at the PT. Remember the prothrombin time is what specifically looks at uh, Coumadin. Um, so if they're over or under anticoagulated, they can um, immediately adjust the, the drug. Uh, 
Like I said, there are multiple drug interactions as well. Coumadin is a really nasty one. Um, people that are on Coumadin are going to be at high risk for bleeding. Another anticoagulant that's commonly used is heparin. And heparin has two major forms. So heparin is a kind of a, a polymer. It's a long chain of molecules. And so that's the kind of the OG heparin. And then what we can do is we can chop the heparin up into smaller units. And that's referred to as low molecular weight heparin or LMWH heparin. That's what that stands for, low molecular weight. So sometimes the regular heparin is referred to as unfractionated. It hasn't been chopped up, fractionated. Um, and then the low molecular weight heparin um, is just that chopped up heparin. Um, low molecular weight heparin often goes by the trade name Lovenox. So heparin and Lovenox are the same thing, but Lovenox is just a chopped up version of heparin. Um, they both work by inhibiting coagulation through antithrombin. They interact with antithrombin and they also have an inhibitory effect on factor 10A. So they prevent factor 10 from con being converted into its active form, 10A, all right? So heparin can be given intravenously. That's typically how it's given. Whereas low molecular weight heparin can actually be given subcutaneously, typically, you know, twice a day. Um, and so low molecular weight heparin is often used as what we call DVT prophylaxis. So people who are at risk for DVT may receive shots of low molecular weight heparin. Um, so people that are hospitalized, for example, or have had orthopedic procedures where they're not moving around, they have immobility, um, they may start getting, they receive um, Lovenox or low molecular weight heparin to prevent them from developing a DVT while they're hospitalized. Whereas heparin tends to be intravenous and we can, heparin's used for many things. People that have invasive catheters, right? So uh, think of um, all the various central lines, um, the calves, um, Grishon, non Grishon, those kinds of things. Um, oftentimes heparin is used to uh, prevent the clotting of these catheters because those catheters are used uh, frequently and for extended periods of time. So think of people that um, maybe need to receive chemotherapy, uh, maybe people that are receiving antibiotics uh, over an extended period of time, things like that, uh, where you want to keep that invasive line, the, the pick line, the central line, whatever it is, you want to keep it patent for an extended period of time they may receive heparin. Heparin is sometimes used in people that are having acute coronary syndrome, heart attacks, OMIs as well. It, they'll receive a bolus of heparin and then they'll receive an, 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 an continuous infusion of heparin while they're uh, getting ready to go to the cath lab. Um, oftentimes heparin, large massive doses of heparin are given to patients in surgery or cath or it's an act club prevent clot from occurring during the surgery. Um, things you want to know about this: heparin is actually given in units, so it is not milligrams or micrograms like we're used to. It's actually in units, similar to insulin. Whereas a low molecular weight heparin actually is in milligrams. Right, so low or low molecular weight heparin is going to be milligrams, whereas heparin, the unfractionated form, is going to be in units. Um, people that receive heparin are at elevated risk for called HIT, and that stands for heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So there is an immune reaction that can occur. in some percentage of patients that receive heparin, and that causes a destruction of platelets. 
That's what thrombocytopenia is. So they have a decrease in platelets and that could potentially be problematic. So we need to monitor their platelet count and we also want to monitor the PTT. So the partial thromboplastin time is what tells us how therapeutic heparin is, whereas the PT focuses more on Coumadin or Warfarin. All right. And there is an antidote for this. The antidote for heparin is something called protamine sulfate, reverse the effects of heparin. And FFP, fresh frozen plasma, will also reverse the effects of heparin, um, like uh, Coumadin. And if if the patient has thrombocytopenia, they may also require platelet infusions. Um, so protamine sulfate is kind of like the direct antidote uh, for heparin. And sometimes, um, sometimes like in surgery or cath lab, we will overdose. We will intentionally overdose people on heparin because we don't want them to clot during a procedure and then reverse the overdose with protamine. So that's not an uncommon thing that, that can happen. All right, so that is a uh, heparin. Okay, it is already 1030. So are there any questions so far? Anybody have any questions? Okay, chat, let's go. All right, well, let's go ahead and take another break. Uh, I'll see you all back at 1045. All right, good day. Good to have you. Good to have everybody back. So we're going to move into our final uh, hour of lecturing. Uh, like I said, we're lecturing a little longer today just because we don't have a lab, and uh, that should allow us to get caught up a little bit as well. All right. So before we get going, anybody have any questions? So quick question. Um, with your 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 anticoagulants, um, your patient still has the ability to clot somewhat. Like if they get a scratch, they're just not gonna bleed until there's nothing left, correct? Yes, yes. So okay. um, yeah, that's the goal of anticoagulation is to not overdo it. But like, you know, if somebody were to like have a, a massive overdose of, of Coumadin, for example, they may, yeah, they may be in a situation where, yeah, they would have a hard time clotting and they could you know, bleed to death internally typically, you know, or they could have a intracranial hemorrhage um, that, that could kill them. Um, so there is that possibility, but the goal is to, to um, make it more difficult for them to clot, but not so difficult that they just hemorrhage uh, whenever there's any sort of injury or insult. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. No problem at all. All right. Well, there, there's still some additional stuff that we need to talk about or we need to get through in regards to uh, um, anticoagulant pharmacology. And so let me go ahead and just do that now. Let me share this with you all. All right, so moving on, just some additional agents. Uh, so there's another agent called uh, Clopidrogel or Plavix, uh, which is an example of a category of drugs referred to as the P2Y12 inhibitors. Um, Plavix is one example, a uh, Ticlid is another example that I could give, but Plavix uh, tends to be a common drug that people take particularly people that have had stents um, placed. And so this works as an anticoagulant by, um, it inhibits the binding of adenosine diphosphate to a special receptor on the platelet called the P2Y12 receptor. And what that does is then that goes on to inhibit a glycoprotein on the surface of the platelet called the, well, 
the 2B3A glycoprotein complex. And the 2B3A glycoprotein complex actually is what helps the platelets aggregate. Um, so it's similar to aspirin, but aspirin works through the thrombaxane mechanism, not the, uh, the glycoprotein complex. Um, so the functionally flavis tickled and other agents that belong in this category functionally act as antiplatelet agents, but they don't inhibit uh, prostaglandins like aspirin. So you don't have all that prostaglandin stuff going on. Um, so plavis is much more specific in its mechanism of action. Um, the same kinds of concerns as far as um, the risk for bleeding um, comes into play here. Uh, the next group of drugs are the glycoprotein inhibitors themselves. So these are drugs that, unlike um, the P2Y12 inhibitors, directly inhibit the 2B3A complex. And so these are referred to as the glycoprotein 2B and 3A inhibitors. Um, and these are given as an IV infusion. And these tend to be given for a very special kind of um, very special kind of a of a occlusive myocardial infarction or acute coronary syndrome referred to as an in STEMI or a non ST elevation myocardial infarction. So when we look at somebody having an OMI, an occlusive myocardial infarction, or an acute coronary syndrome, there are, there are a couple of like major categories. The first category is what we call the STEMI. So when you look at the ECG, all right. So this is the P wave here, this is the Q, this is the R, this is the S, and this is the T wave. There we go. So we're looking at is this little area right here, that's, I'm going to circle it in blue, that's called the J point. And when that J point goes above the baseline, it causes something referred to as ST elevation. So it'll look something like this. So you can see that the J point here is above the baseline and that is ST elevation. And when somebody has that, that is referred to as a STEMI, ST elevation myocardial infarction. But there are other ones where you don't get that. Um, and these are referred to as in STEMI slash USA or unstable angina, which so in STEMI slash unstable angina is a, another category of acute coronary syndromes. And that's where these infusions are often used. If somebody's having an in STEMI and they're going to the cath lab in the next 24 hours, but not necessarily right now, um, we may load them up with uh, one of these drugs. And these include things like um, Integralin, Agristat, and Reapro. And I just included them down there. Tyrofabin, um, Abaximab, um, are the generics fibrostat and repro. Those are just some examples of the, the global inhibitors. So before I move on, let me just ask you a question. Could you ever think of a reason why we want to prevent a clot from breaking down? So I've been talking about anticoagulants and antiplatelets preventing clot formation, but is there any reason why we'd ever want to prevent the clot breaking down, you all think? To prevent bleeding. Yeah, so maybe somebody is in a situation where they're bleeding and we want their clots to stay intact. We don't want the clots to break down. Is there any pharmaceutical agent we have in our 
um, in our toolbox, so to speak, that we could use in this capacity? TXA. What is TXA? What is that? Tranexamic acid. Tranexamic acid, right. Yeah, or tranexamic acid. Good. So it's... And how does it work? What's its mechanism of action? It inhibits the activation of plasminogen to plasmin. Yeah. So what it does is it actually it it um it interferes with a receptor found on plasminogen. So there's something called the lysine receptor, and that you're absolutely right is found on uh, plasminogen. All right. And if that receptor gets bound, that prevents plasmin All right. from binding. And you're absolutely right. Um, it pr prevents this from being converted into its inactive form. And what that does is that ultimately stabilizes the fibrin clot that's being produced or what we call the fibrin matrix. Oh, I just had a uh, crash here. Make sure that that resets. Okay. Yeah, so it essentially prevents that fibrin clot or helps stabilize it and prevent it from breaking down. Um, so how do we give it? Is, it? is it hard or easy to get or what's like, how do we administer it? Give it, uh, well, in our guidelines, we give one gram in a 250 ml bag over 10 minutes. Good. So you just take a you just take a one gram vial or thousand milligrams, and then you mix it in a hundred milliliters, and then you give that over ten minutes, right? So you're essentially going to hang it as a piggyback and just give it wide open. Yeah. Um, so is that it though? Is that the end of the story? You have, no, second dose, you have second dose of eight hours. Good. So the second gram, so that's so this is the loading dose. Think of this as the bolus or the loading dose, right? Like you're going to give somebody a loading dose of lidocaine or amiodarone, some of those that we talked about in lab, and then follow up with a maintenance infusion. So that's a loading dose. And then the maintenance infusion is, is one gram, right? or a thousand milligrams, but instead of over 10 minutes, it's going to occur over eight hours, right? So it'd be very, very slow. And so you don't ever want to exceed um, more than grams total. So that is TXA and it's pretty safe. Um, the big thing that you want to know about TXA is if you give it too rapidly, what happens if TXA is given too rapidly? Does anyone know what the side effect is there? Hypotension. Is it? Oh. Yeah, hypotension. So you don't ever want to give it more rapidly than what is recommended in our guidelines because it can precipitate hypotension. Yeah.
And why would we give it? Like what, what kind of patients? Who are the candidates for TXA? Trauma. Non-compressible trauma memory. Yeah, so hemorrhagic trauma. And somebody mentioned non-compressible. What does that mean? Something you can't put a tourniquet on or put a pressure dressing yeah. on. Yeah. So most of your non-compressible bleeding is going to occur either in your abdominal cavity or your thoracic cavity or sometimes your retroperitoneal cavity, but you don't really have the ability to uh, compress it to stop the bleeding. So internal hemorrhage, internal bleeding is essentially what we're talking about here. Yeah. Um, and in some cases, and in fact, this is, um, it has been used for this for a, a sub substantial period of time, believe it or not. And that is postpartum hemorrhage as well. So postpartum hemorrhage. bleeding following birth. Um, and does anyone know like what the OG use for TXA was way back in the day when this was, when this first came about? Does anyone know what the OG use for this was? Was it nosebleeds? Yeah. Yeah, epistaxis. Specifically epistaxis in um, patients that had hemophilia. So this is before um, before we were able to, uh, to uh, identify and concentrate the various clotting factors, be it 7A or 7 or whatever was needed to uh, give to people with hemophilia. Yeah, so TXA has been around for a long time. This is nothing new. It's just that we are seeing it uh, being used in it, maybe for a new um, indication, if you will. Excellent. Excellent. I wanted to just make sure I mentioned TXA because it is something that has been fairly recently added uh, to our school of practice here in the state. Hey, Excellent. Chris. All right. Well, yes. Uh, on the special notes, it gives us a time frame saying that the loading dose needs to be given within the first three hours. Why is that? Yeah. So, um, there, so essentially, um, when we did the research on this, um, this just comes from the research, um, and they looked at it, um, it, it, it tended to be the most effective within the first hour. Um, and essentially what they saw is the further out you got uh, from giving it the increased mortality you actually had an increase in side of in um, complications and mortality um, so uh, that is where that recommendation came from was just looking at the research and going huh in people that are getting txa for for some reason um, they are having more problems if um, we give it further than uh, about three hours out so that's why and, we recommend. And does the age have anything to do with like what you were talking about with giving younger patients aspirin? Uh, no, not that I'm aware of. Um, I'm, I'm sure, I mean, age in general, uh, but the, the studies that were done um, that looked at this with trauma uh, didn't really look so much at that age. Um, they just kind of just broadly looking, um, they just, for whatever reason, it's not well understood, but there's actually increased risk of death and bleeding. Um, if it's given after, after three hours, um, it's not like huge. It's like, um, if given in under three hours, it's like a 3%, um, versus like four, 4.4%. So it's not like a huge difference, but it is, it is a, a, a little difference. I'm sorry with, with age, I was. I was talking, I, I changed gears on you. It says it's not approved in patients under 18. 
Yeah. And, and that's just because we don't have a lot of studies. So the, it was the crash two um, was, the, was the big study that a lot of people referenced the crash two um, study. And I believe um, they did not look at pediatric patients. So it may work. It's just, we don't have a whole lot of evidence to, to go on. So it's like, well, we don't really know. So, you know, not right now. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Yeah, and that was, and that's those studies. I think the original crash two study was done way back in 2010. Um, yeah, so, uh, and we just, you know, I, at least I'm not aware of a whole lot of stuff looking at kids with this. So yeah, maybe, maybe we'll see what happens in the future. Obviously, everybody's really focused on COVID right now. <laughs> That's where a lot of research coming out on COVID, a lot of stuff is maybe taken somewhat of a back burner. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Good, good discussion about, about that. Okay. So now that brings us to the next category of agents I want to talk about. And these are not antiplatelets and anticoagulants, but rather these are what we call fibrinolytics. These are often referred to as thrombolytics. But I want to emphasize that this is a vernacular term and it is not entirely accurate to call these drugs thrombolytics. And that is to say that their main mechanism of action is a uh, the primary mechanism of action of these drugs is actually fibrin, breaking the fibrin clot back down into fibrinogen. That's really where these agents primarily work. And so I tend to call them fibrinolytics as opposed to thrombolytics, although thrombolytic is a common vernacular term that's used. So what, what are these drugs you used to do? What do you all think? Break down clots. Yeah, so these are used to break down clots, not prevent clot formation, but to actually break a clot down. All right. So, what kinds of patients would be candidates for fibrinolytics? Ischemic really stroke patients. Say it again. Ischemic stroke patients. Okay, so it's stroke is one category of people that might benefit. Who else? Occlusive MIs. Good, occlusive myocardial infarctions. Yeah, specifically the STEMI, the ST elevation myocardial, myocardial infarction. Yeah, those are the two main categories of patients who stand the most to benefit. There are some other patients that may get fibrinolytics like pulmonary embolic. They have a pulmonary embolism um, and you have limited ability to treat that. They may receive fibrinolytics or if you have a, a acute limb ischemia because a clot has clogged up a, a, a major a blood vessel in an arm or a leg, um, something like that. But acute ischemic strokes and a, acute OMIs, the STEMI are your major indications. Um, and the uh, fibrinolytics have been around for for some decades now. And they actually, if you all remember back to pathophysiology, when I was talking about streptococcus, and I said, one of the things that we do is we do the hemolysis test and you look for, um, out, you look for complete versus incomplete versus none. Um, and so we've known for quite a while that the streptococcal bacteria release various compounds that have an impact on the blood, you know, can break blood cells down and can prevent blood from clotting or break blood clots down. And we discovered what that compound was. And that was actually the first um, 
of these fibrinolytics. And so the first agent that was developed was something called streptokinase. And that's just the enzyme that breaks the fibrin plot down. And then from that, we have developed um, additional agents based on that enzyme. Um, and so streptokinase is kind of the OG, but we have urokinase, TNKase, sometimes referred to as tenecteplase. Um, you have uh, retoplase, sometimes referred to as actoplase. You have TPA, tissue plasminogen activator. TPA. All right, so many different examples of these. They all have the basically the same mechanism mechanism of action, and they have basically the same indication and cautions, obviously the big cautions. And if you're going to even think about using these, a very strict checklist needs to be followed. You follow a very strict checklist as it pertains to these. Um, so these patients cannot have bleeding, right? So they cannot have recent recent major surgery, right, or trauma, a history of bleeding ulcers. They cannot be severely hypertensive. And there are, uh, typically there are blood pressure guidelines that you need to follow. And that is because the risk of a hemorrhagic stroke is elevated in patients who are super hypertensive. So this may be this may be one of the situations where you might think about um, uh, treating hypertension. Um, although you're not going to treat it aggressively, you're just going to get under the blood pressure guidelines um, for uh, the checklist. And uh, we will go we will dive into these checklists in more detail in cardiovascular emergencies during ACLS. Uh, where they specifically talk about uh, the checklist and some of these. So um, we're just being kind of broad here. Recent surgery or trauma, bleeding ulcers, um, uncontrolled, severe hypertension, all contraindications uh, for fibrinolytics. Um, if you have abnormal blood vessels in your brain, something called AVMs or AV malformation, um, or a history of a past stroke. So not recent, but if you have, to have had a stroke in the past, um, these patients will also be at elevated risk for uh, intracranial hemorrhage specifically. So things to note here, if, if you go through the checklist of your candidate and they receive these medications, um, you need to have multiple IV access. And that needs to be prior to giving the fibrinolytic. Because once fibrinolytic goes in, you cannot be prodding the patient, drawing blood, doing any trauma at, to them at all, because they literally, for a short period of time, will not be able to form clots. They'll be breaking clots down, in fact, right? Um, so you want to get multiple IV lines in place prior to giving this. And it needs to have its own, it needs to have its own or a dedicated IV. And I should just say in general, most medications, if you're going to give a medication to somebody, should have a dedicated IV. There is the concept of compatibility. And if you give incompatible medications, right? So you're giving two, two uh, meds through the same IV line, for example, and they're incompatible, they can precipitate. That means the 
fall out of solution and can crystallize and can cause emboli and uh, thrombi and all sorts of problems. So in general, if you, if you don't know something is, if you don't know two drugs are compatible, just don't give them, give them through their own deck, right? If you're giving dopamine, for example, and you need to hang an amiodarone drip, um, I don't know if they're compatible off the top of my head. There are lists, there are um, compatibility diagrams that you can reference, but I don't know off the top of my head. So I'm going to give amiodarone through its own IV. And then I'm going to give uh, the dopamine, say, through its own IV um, when, in, when in doubt, when compatibility comes into doubt. And that's definitely the same with these fibrinolytics. And you will need to very closely monitor the patient's neurological status. You want to get their baseline neurological status, and then you will frequently monitor every five minutes or so um, while they're receiving or after they have received a fibrinolytic. Some of the fibrinolytics are, it's like a one-shot and done situation. <clears throat> For example, a, a TNKase, it's a shot. It's a slow IV push, and then you're done. Uh, some of them, like Redivase, you give half the dose up front, and then in 30 minutes, the other half is given. Um, but some of these, like TPA, for example, they're given as a prolonged infusion. So um, you want to know that. Um, and in fact, uh, Redivase or Rediplace is uh, if somebody's received that, you're transporting them. You know that because you may need to give that second dose during the transport, right? So you kind of <clears throat> just got to research and, you know, what did they get? Um, a lot of people are going with like the TNKAs just because it's a one and done uh, kind of situation, but every hospital is going to be different potentially in what they use and what they get reimbursed from and, and so on and so forth. All right. So any questions about the fibrinolytics? Everybody okay there? All right, excellent. Um, the last group of medications I wanna mention, and I've actually talked about them before, um, so I won't spend a whole lot of time talking about them. I just want to mention those are the DOACs. The DOACs. And these are the newer anticoagulants. They, that stands for direct acting oral anticoagulants. So these are agents that have very specific, they target very specific clotting factors. And the good thing about these agents is, or one of the many good things about these agents is that they have very few medication interactions. So they are much safer than, say, something like Coumadin or Warfarin, which interacts with everything and, and, and many foods as well. These have very few interactions, right? You don't need to do blood tests all the time. Right? So... The amount of testing that you have to do is minimal versus, you know, something like uh, Lovenox or, or Coumadin, where you're having to frequently uh, look at the PT or PTT, right? You don't have to do that as often with these. Um, you can stop taking them. And typically within a few days, the effects will diminish, you know, within about 24 hours or so the effects will, will diminish. So if somebody does get a little over anticoagulated, they stop taking their med, right? And they are better. Or let's say they need surgery, right? 
somebody needs surgery, they stop taking their med for a day or two, they can have the procedure and then they can go back on it after the procedure. However, there really are good antidotes. There have been fairly recently some antidotes that have been marketed for very specific DOACs. Um, and I can't really speak on the evidence. It's, there's been, there has been some contention about some of these antidotes that these new antidotes have been developed. So I, I don't know that there's been great resolution, but you cannot necessarily rely on having an antidote available for a dope for some of these dope. Um, but in general, uh, looking at large numbers of patients, Patients tend to do better on the DOAX. They tend to have a substantially lower uh, morbidity and mortality when compared to other agents, like specifically like Coumadin or Warfarin. So we're actually seeing the DOAX begin to dominate over uh, agents like Coumadin or Warfarin. So these DOAX are becoming more popular. Can, can any of you think of uh, some examples? I'm sure you've run into them, but can you think of some, some examples of DOAX? I think one of them is Eloquis. Eloquis, yeah. Yeah, that is a common one. Eloquis, and I'll write down the generic for that. Apaxabam, or ban rather. So it's Eloquis. Um, another one is Prodaxia. Uh, oh, actually, I don't think it's I, I think it's an AXA. Prodaxia, all known as Dabigatrin, generic. Uh, uh, Rivaraxaban or Zeralto is another common one as well. Rivaraxaban. Um, the enunciation on these could be tough. And, you know, it's funny, I have a degree in pharmaceutical science and I still struggle. Um, but those are just some common examples of the DOAX. Um, the side effects and major problems still going to be the same as far as the bleeding risk, but some of the other issues are um, fairly minimized when it comes to interactions and things of that nature. Um, so you need to be aware of these, know that they're out there, and know that they are in some areas overtaking more traditional anticoagulants like uh, Coumadin or Warfarin. All right. So now we finally arrived at uh, where I wanted to be <laughs> this morning. Um, so, but that's okay. We're, we're going to have plenty of time to get through stuff. So I'm just going to prime you for this. And then we will pick up on this tomorrow since we're actually nearing the end of the third hour. And I don't want to go any longer than three hours um, because I think brains will just kind of melt and, and that'll be that. Um, so, what we're going to focus on tomorrow. And you'll have drug card assignments that reflect this as well. You, we're going to focus on the um, analgesics. Analgesics. All right. Going to be a big uh, category of agents that we will uh, focus on tomorrow. Sedatives. Induction agents, and paralytics, sometimes referred to as neuromuscular blockers. So they block neuromuscular function. So analgesics, they're about relieving pain, right? And there are a couple of major categories that we call the non-steroidals, the NSAIDs, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs have analgesic properties. 
And these include aspirin or acetyl salicylic acid. And there's a, another one that is, it, it's not a new drug, but it is new to us and we're starting to use it. Does anyone know what the other one is? It's given intravenously. It can be given IM as well. Toradol. Toralac. Toradol or, or Catorolac. Good. Catorolac or Toradol. Good. And we're seeing that it has made its way into the pre-hospital environment, right? And typically, it's given IV. can be given anywhere from 15 to 30 milligrams slow IV push in the adult patient. And essentially it has all the same issues as aspirin or as complications and side effects. Um, and NSAIDs in general can be very hard on the kidneys. So if you have underlying kidney dysfunction, NSAIDs in general should be used cautiously, but Right, some of the, the same issues as far as um, the bleeding risk, um, gastrointestinal upset and erosion, right? Those kinds of things um, you run into there. Um, and then the other major category of analgesics are what we call the opioids. The opioids and the opiates. And there is a differentiation. An opiate is something that comes directly from, and does anyone know what plant these classes of agents are based on? Uh, poppy? Yeah, the poppy. So an agent that comes directly from the poppy is called an opiate. And, and they're really only two major ones that we run into. There's morphine and codeine. And if there's any chemical modification at all, then those are what we call opioids. So opioids are, are um, not op opiates, are directly derived from the poppy from opium, which, which includes morphine and codeine. So it comes from opium and you get morphine and codeine out of that. Whereas the opioids are chemically modified, even if it's just minimal. So everything else is pretty much an opioid, fentanyl, hydromorphone or dilaudid, meperidine or demerol, Right, um, hydrocodone, and sometimes these opioids, the oral versions of them, are all also mixed with another analgesic called acetaminophen. All right. like hydrocodone plus acetaminophen is sometimes referred to as Lortab or Vicodin, right? And whenever you see that, you'll see um, the dose on the, on, on the tablets, you'll see something like five slash 500. And that just means there's five milligrams of hydrocodone and 500 milligrams of acetaminophen. And acetaminophen is another analgesic. Um, it has some mechanism that is related to the NSAIDs, some sort of prostaglandin mechanism. But unlike the NSAIDs, it doesn't impact the stomach lining. It doesn't impact um, clotting. It's not as bad on the kidneys, although when overdosed, it's, it's tough on the uh, liver. And do we use acetaminophen in the pre-hospital environment? In yes, our pediatric yeah. patients? Yeah, and we're not using it so much as an analgesic, although it does have analgesic properties, but we're using it more for its antipyretic properties for fever reducer. What's the dose? 15 milligrams per kilogram? 
Yeah, that's that's a pretty decent dose. Yeah, about 15 milligrams per kilogram. And what route is this given? For osseous. Yeah, it's given orally. Can also be given as a suppository. And then there's one other um, analgesic that falls under the NSAID category, and that is ibuprofen, also known as Motrin. And is that one we could administer? Yes. yes. Good. Um, but it's like acetaminophen, and that's really only for peds uh, patients without special skill. Um, it is an NSAID, but it does not have the risk of RISE syndrome like you see with aspirin, even though its basic mechanism of action is the same as the other NSAIDs. And this is the dose of ibuprofen. You're going to use it. Ten milligrams per kilogram. Yeah, five to ten milligrams per kilogram. Good. Again, PO. So you need to have patent airway. And this is primarily used for fever management in a febrile kid where you may have a prolonged transport. Okay, excellent. Um, so we'll talk about those in some detail as well as sedatives. Major category of sedatives that we run into are the um, benzodiazepines, and there are all non-benzodiazepine sedatives out there. Um, induction agents, these are agents that are used in airway management to cause a loss of unconsciousness or to induce loss of consciousness. And sometimes analgesics and sedatives will fall into the induction agent class. So if you give somebody a large enough dose of fentanyl, for example, it may act as an induction agent. And then the paralytics are used to paralyze skeletal muscle, often during airway management. And we'll talk about the two major categories of neuromuscular blockers. And then we'll also talk about a very special medication that acts as an analgesic at certain doses and can also act as a sedative or an induction agent at other doses. And does anyone know what that drug is or what I'm referencing? Ketamine. Ketamine, yeah. So ketamine or Keltor, Keltar at lower doses acts as an analgesic. And then at higher doses, you start getting dissociation. It can act as a sedative. And we'll talk about that tomorrow as well. All right. So before I let you all go, do you have any questions or any of the material we've covered today? Because I know we've been through quite a bit. The last couple of days have been a lot of cardiac stuff, cardiovascular stuff. Okay, chat looks good. All right. Um, so just as a reminder, you'll have uh, drug cards due. There'll be quizzes due. So keep up on those. Uh, hopefully the, uh, the fact that we don't have a lab this afternoon will give you a little extra time to get caught up on all that. Uh, let's see here. What else do we have going on? Uh, there's something else. Oh, um, regarding some of the later drug card assignments. Uh, so some of the later drug card assignments um, like four and five, I believe, I do not want you to do a drug card on every single drug that I have labeled there. So let me just go ahead and pull up one of these later drug card assignments and I'll, I'll show you, tell you what I want. And it, it will save you a lot of work. Uh, so let me go to, let me just pull up drug card set five, for example. And I'll share it here and I'll show you what I mean. Um, and this should make it a lot easier for you to. Go. Yeah, yeah, here we go. All right, so let me go in and share. 
Okay. Pull the screen up here. There we go. Okay. So um, I do not want you to do a drug card on every single SSRI that I have labeled here. So citalopram and flu, fluoxetine and peroxetine. Um, these are just examples of common SSRIs. I just want you to do a drug card on the class. And I think I put that there in the instructions, um, but I just wanna make that clear that just do a drug card on the class. So you don't need to worry about the dosing or any of that. Just what are SSRIs? What's their basic mechanism of action? How are they used? What are the common side effects? Cautions, inter you know, all of that. Um, but we're just talking about it as a class and you're not doing a drug card on every single one of these. Same thing with tricyclic antidepressants, right? You're just doing a drug card on the class versus I'm just giving you examples. Same thing with the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. The same thing with the anti-seizure medications, although we will talk about the anti-seizure medications in some detail later on in this class because um, there are specific examples that have different mechanisms like diazepam, right? So clonazepam and diazepam, their mechanism, they are actually um, benzodiazepines, right? Commonly used as sedatives. Their mechanism of action is very different from say um, levetiracetam or Keppra. Um, mood stabilizers, again, mood stabilizers are very similar, right? The, these uh, drugs have very different mechanism of act, like lithium, for example, has a very different mechanism of action as say carbamazepine. And many of these drugs that are mood stabilizers also have anti-seizure effects, right? Um, so there's a lot of crossing over. For example, carbamazepine here, Tegretol, you could see it sometimes uses a, as an anti-seizure med, it sometimes uses a mood stabilizer. Um, and then um, the typical antipsychotics versus the atypical antipsychotics. Just again, just do a drug card on the individual, on the classes, not the individual agents, um, as well as the diabetic medications. There are more diabetic medications than you could even think of. I'm just giving you some examples. Um, and these specific classes, subclasses, the sulfonylureas, uh, so things like, um, Oh, let me think of a common um, metformin, right? Glucophage uh, would be an example of a sulfonylurea uh, versus like a DPP-4 inhibitor or an SGL-2 inhibitor. Um, and I actually have videos loaded in that will focus on these specific classes. So just do a, just do a drug card on them as a whole. Like, you know, what, what are the major things that they're used for? What are the major um, side effects? that we look at with and with a diet uh, with antihyperglycemics in general. All right. So does that help? Does that help clear any questions any, any you all may have about those those up hopefully? Yes sir. Hopefully that makes it a little easier as well. You're not having to do all this trouble. Okay. You say well, anything about the five? Uh, say that again? Did you say anything about the fifth set? What about it? Uh, is there because uh, you, you said uh, four and five you said time so i don't know if you're going to go over five uh, yeah i just no i just showed you the the set just five the okay yeah no i no i just i used set five as an example right to show you hey you don't need to do a drug card in every single one of these just do it on and it, and it even says at the top you know focus on the class right do a drug card on the class of agent not the individual agent copy thank you yeah, wherever you see that wherever you see that posted in your homework assignment that 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 means okay i don't have to do a drug card on every single one of these drugs yeah okay uh excellent any other questions yeah there's some uh quizzes it's showing the due date as 0800 tomorrow is that accurate or are those supposed to be 11 o'clock tomorrow night um, I believe that's accurate. Um, I'll let me go in. Normally the quizzes are set for eight in the morning because that way you. Uh, Mr. No. Mr.
prior, That's to, it. prior to me lecturing. So does that does that kind of make sense? Sorry about the screaming child. That's okay. Yeah, so the reason they're set at eight is because we lecture at eight thirty, and so I, I, I uh, the reason I have that built in is that way you've covered that material prior to us talking about the topic in lecture. <clears throat> That's like why all the cardiovascular drug cards were due um, earlier this week. That way you've covered it, and then we hit it again in, in class, and so um, they are you're you're getting that content occurring at the same time. All right, any other, any other questions? So quick question on um, the heparin and the low dose heparin. Can we put those on the same card since they're basically the same thing? They're just, Absolutely. okay. The, the low molecular, not low dose, low molecular yeah, weight. Low molecular, sorry. No worries, yeah. Yeah, of course, because it's, it's basically, it's all heparin, yeah. Not a problem. Well, I think I'll let you all go then. And um, we again, we will not have a lab. So I will just see you all in the morning. Sounds good. All right. Thank you, all, right, thank you all so much. Take care. Have a good one.